let's lead with what I think is in college sports the topic of the day. And it came on Wednesday night, Tuesday night, FedEx Forum, the Memphis Tigers hosting the Alabama Crimson Tide. And if you listen to this podcast, you know I love college hoops. I haven't talked a ton of college hoops at this point this year. But I've talked a lot about a couple teams. I've talked a lot about Memphis, who is terrible. And I've talked a lot about Alabama, who has been awesome this year. Well, what happens? Alabama just two nights off of that dramatic last second win over Houston. Craziness in the streets of Coleman Coliseum. We got Kellen and Kelvin Sampson yelling and screaming and throwing stuff. Uh, Two nights after that, three nights after that, they go to FedEx Forum. Memphis coming off four straight losses. And naturally what happens, Memphis 92, Alabama 78 in the biggest win of the Penny Hardaway era. Congrats to Penny Hardaway. There have been a lot of people that have been critical of him, myself certainly included. But Aaron right, Aaron wrong. I do this every week. I'm going to do it later in the show. And Penny Hardaway had his team better prepared better focused, better locked in, better ready to go. They were the better team, and they deserve to win. And so as far as the game itself, let me say this. While I have been critical of Penny Hardaway, if you listen to this show and if you follow me on Twitter at Aaron underscore Torres, you know that I've kind of said, look, this team has problems, but there have been signs that they might be able to figure it out. I've been critical because Penny Hardaway doesn't know how to put together a rotation because there's too many mental mistakes, missed free throws, things like that. But I've also said, like, look, if you watch these games, and I watch the entire Georgia game, I watch the entire Ole Miss game, I watch a lot of the Murray State game, and I watch the entire Alabama game on Tuesday night, I, I, I did say, like, 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 most of those games were winnable, okay? The Georgia game, when Memphis played Georgia a few weeks ago, shout out Tom Crean, my boy, love me some Tom Crean. They lose by three on the road in a game that was just sloppy. It was ugly. They had, uh, uh, you know, they just, they, 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 too many dumb mistakes against Georgia. They finished seven of 20 from three. It was just a weird game that they easily could have won, but I would say that was probably the worst performance that I saw from them. The Ole Miss game, they lose 67 63 in a game where they shot, how about this? 23 of 37 from the free throw line, okay? I'm not great at math, but when you miss 14 foul shots and you lose by four, it means that if you were just like a little bit better at the foul line, they call them free throws for a reason, you could have easily won that game. And then after the Murray State game, I would go back and, and, and go back and look at my Twitter feed. I said, I actually saw some signs of improvement in that Murray State game, as weird as it sounds, even though you're never supposed to lose to Missouri State, Murray State, excuse me, if you're Memphis. In that game, they shot much better from the free throw line. In that game, they actually did much better in terms of turnovers. And I said, look, if they can use any momentum, things will start going in the right direction soon. Now, I didn't think they were going to beat Alabama. If I did, I would have waited till they played Alabama to record the Air Tour Sports Podcast. So I didn't think today was the day that they could turn it around, but today was the day that they turned it around. And again, it's credit to Penny Hardaway. Listen, I've said it a million times. Everybody thinks I don't like Penny Hardaway. I, first of all, I love Penny Hardaway. He was one of my favorite players growing up. I, I loved Penny Hardaway as a player. Um, but when you are a head coach and you say you want all the smoke, And you say before the 2019-2020 season, I expect to win a national championship. And before the NCAA tournament was canceled, you weren't even projected to go. You have no signature wins in year four. It's hard for me to just like defend you blindly. And so that was the deal with Penny Hardaway. But in terms of Tuesday night, listen, it all came together. Now, is it going to come together for the next three months, NCAA tournament, all that stuff? We'll talk about that down the road. But on this night, it all came together. If you watch the game, this was the first time they ran a real offense. Like guys were cutting, moving, passing. Um, you know, they, they, they kept running these pick and rolls that were killing Alabama. Uh, wide open jumpers. Uh, in terms of, of, of everything else, 8 of 23 from 3. They shot the ball from 3 much better. 20 of 25 from the foul line. Not great at math. That's 80% though. Took care of the ball a little bit better. Had fewer turnovers than Alabama. And the one thing you can never say about Penny Hardaway's teams They defend their butts off. They have always defended their butts off. Offense has been the problem. And in this game, they did a great job on offense, on defense. Held Alabama to 10 of of 33 shooting from threes. Um, Alabama had 20 turnovers. Memphis won the rebounding battle. And so let's just do some math here. It doesn't matter who you play. If you win the rebounding battle, if you 
make 12 more free throws. And if you force the team to turn the ball over 20 times, you're probably going to win the game. And so that's exactly what happened. Memphis wins the game, best win of the Penny Hardaway era. And what I would say is what they did today was very sustainable. They, they were aggressive. They were fearless. They defended their butts off. They were great in transition. They took care of the ball. When Alabama tried to press, they exposed it with one dunk, layup, uh, layup, dunk, uncontested shot after the other. And that was how they pulled away because it did get interesting late in the game. What I find really interesting, though, is this. Penny Hardaway just picked up his biggest win of his career. Congrats to him. I hope Memphis is good. I've said it a million times. I hope Memphis is good. It'd be awesome for college basketball if a team coached by Penny Hardaway with Larry Brown and Rasheed Wallace as assistants and with Amani Bates, Jalen Duran on their team was awesome. I hope it works out. I hope they're great. But what I would say about Penny Hardaway is this. Penny Hardaway, in picking up his biggest win of his entire career as a head coach at the college level, now has a very interesting decision to make. And why is that? If you watch this game, you notice something. In the first half, Amani Bates, their true freshman, 17 years old, reclassified one of the highest rated recruits, one of the most touted recruits in the history of high school basketball. The kid that was once compared to Kevin Durant was once compared to LeBron James. Those comparisons stopped over the last year or so. But Memphis made their run in the first half when Amani Bates went to the bench. In the second half, Penny Hardaway did not play Amani Bates after the 16-minute mark. And on the game, Amani Bates finished one of six from the field by far, not by far, but his fewest field goal attempts of the season. Final 16 minutes, the most hyped player maybe in all of college basketball did not play this game. And if you've watched Memphis, if you've played attention, what I would say is a couple things. One, I hope everyone understands. This is not a criticism of Imani Bates. This is not Aaron Torres rooting against Imani Bates. But he's 17 years old. I've talked about him a ton on this podcast. He was a kid that was never coached well, always played for his dad. His dad never let him play against good competition. I worried when he decided to reclassify. I said, I don't know if he's going to be ready. Hasn't played real competition. His dad didn't let him play the highest level of AAU until going into this past summer. He did not have success. On top of that, he never played Team USA basketball against the best players in the country. And when you watch him play at Memphis, he's just not ready to play at this level. And that's not a knock on him. And it's not to say he can't go to the NBA. It's not to say he can't be really good. But he's 17 years old. He's not even eligible for this year's draft. And it was clear on Tuesday night that Memphis was better when Imani Bates was not on the floor. And so why I bring it up is because Penny Hardaway now has officially the conundrum that every head coach that recruits one-and-done type talents has. And Amani Bates, by technicality, isn't a one-and-done because he's 17 years old. He's not even eligible for this year's NBA draft. But Penny Hardaway has the conundrum that every single head coach has when you recruit players of Amani Bates' caliber. What happens if they do not play to the level that you expect What happens if your veterans play better? And how do you find that push-pull balance? Because you can even go back. Remember that Ole Miss game? After the Ole Miss game when Penny Hardaway had those insane comments uh, about, uh, you know, uh, whatever he said about, um, you know, about uh, his team and his this and his that. And I, I bring it up because if you go back to what he said after that game, if you remember... Penny Hardaway, after that game, do you remember what he said? He said, and I'm going to read a quote verbatim. I'm going to have to be a complete a-hole from this point forward and only play the players that care. There's a group of people on this team that if I played them, I really feel in my heart we would be undefeated or only have one loss. And so I thought of that quote as I was watching this game. Because on Tuesday, it became very apparent that there is a core of players that are going to help Memphis win a lot of basketball games this year if Penny Hardaway focuses on them. And they're mostly all the veterans. DeAndre Williams, a fifth-year college player that's like 24, 25 years old at this point. Alex Lomax, a upperclassman, fourth-year player who's been in the program forever. Tyler Harris, he was the guy against Ole Miss. They were down by a million points. They put him in. 
He plays well, and immediately everything flips, and Ole Miss uh, and, and Memphis starts playing awesome. Plays tonight has eleven has eleven points. Keep going, Lester Quinones, Landers Nolly. These are fourth, fifth, sixth year college players at some point, and so I think Penny Hardaway now has a real conundrum. He has the conundrum that Coach K has every year, that John Calipari has every year, and that in any given year other coaches have. Do I play the guys that are going to help me win, or do I figure out a way to get the NBA prospects on the floor? Because if I don't develop this NBA prospect, I'm never going to get another elite high school player again. And what I always I always say on this show, look, there's two types of coaches in college basketball. Because we can criticize Coach K for a lot. We can criticize John Calipari for a lot. But they bring in freshmen every year. And they know if we don't get these guys in and we don't get these guys out and we don't get these guys drafted in the position that they're expected to be drafted in, we're not getting any of these elite players again. And so John Calipari and Coach K, I give them credit because they throw the freshmen into the fire and they say, look, guys, we got to figure it out. And you keep playing them and you keep playing them and you keep playing them. And John Calipari is probably not the greatest example this year because outside of Ty Ty Washington, he doesn't really have those freshmen. But those guys, those two coaches specifically, they're the one and done guys. And they know what it's about. And they know we got to keep putting these guys out there, even if they're not going to help us win now, because one, they're our most talented players. And two, they're, they're our most talented players, and down the road they can help us win. But again, we have to get these really talented players in and out because if we don't, then we're deemed failures and we're not good and we don't know what we're doing and all that stuff. And then there's the other coaches, and I've talked about this on the podcast many times. There are other coaches that are just not one-and-done guys. I remember about three years ago, it was actually four years ago because Javon Quinterly was a freshman at Villanova, and I remember tweeting, I said, Javon Quinterly, who ironically plays at Alabama, was at Villanova and could not get off the bench. And it was a big topic early in the season. This is the highest rated recruit uh, Jay Wright signed in forever. He never plays him. What's he going to do? Blah, 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 blah. And I remember saying at that time, I said, if I was the father of a one and done type player, I would not send my son to Villanova because Jay Wright's not a one and done guy. Jay Wright is going to play his older guys. He's going to play his veterans. He is worried about winning every single game, every single possession right now, the second. You can see it this year, by the way. Jay Wright only plays seven. He's got 14 or 15 guys on scholarship because of all the guys that came back because of the COVID year. And he doesn't play any. He only plays six guys. He only plays seven guys. Bill Self is like this. Roy Williams is like this. They're trying to win every game right now. They don't care. It's what puts them in the best position. Whereas John Calipari and Coach K, they may take a loss or two early knowing that they if that, that late they're going to need those freshman guys. And so I'm bringing all this up, and this segment's going really long. We're going to have a long episode of the Air Tour Sports Podcast today because basically the way that I look at it is that John Cal- or that Penny Hardaway now is in a very tough situation. It is very clear the players that are going to win him games this year if he decides to play them. Like I said, DeAndre Williams, Tyler Harris, uh, Landers Nolly, Lester Quinones, Alex Lomax, all the veterans, third, fourth, fifth, sixth-year college players. But what does he do with Imani Bates? And maybe Imani Bates just doesn't care. Maybe Imani Bates wants to come off the bench, only going to play 12, 14, 15 minutes. And maybe Imani Bates, by the end of the year, gets comfortable, gets, gets good in that role. And maybe he's really good. And by the way, Penny Hardaway shouldn't have to rush Imani Bates. He's not even eligible for the draft this year. Doesn't mean he's coming back to Memphis next year, but he's not eligible to go to the draft. So develop him. Be patient. But I think Penny Hardaway has, it's going to be fascinating. Memphis plays Tennessee on Saturday. And I really believe if Penny Hardaway plays the guys he played on Tuesday night, they can obviously beat Tennessee because I think Tennessee's not as good as Alabama. But is he going to go back to Imani Bates? Is he going to play Imani Bates 32 minutes a game? What does he do with Imani Bates? Because I do think that's fascinating. If he decides to be patient with Imani Bates, by the way, this doesn't mean Imani Bates is a bad kid. It doesn't mean Imani Bates is forcing Penny's hand. But what does he do with Imani Bates? Because to me, that is the single key as far as what could work for Penny Hardaway, what could work for Memphis, or what ultimately will not work for them. And it's going to determine their season. Because they're already their back is against the wall. They already have four losses. They did pick up a great win, obviously, this, uh, this uh, Tuesday night against Alabama. They also have a win on top of that over the St. Louis Billikens, who are playing pretty well. So it's not as though their resume is terrible, but they also have four losses. 
And so it's going to be fascinating to see what Penny Hardaway decides to do. Congratulations to Penny Hardaway. Biggest win of his head coaching career. I'm just curious what he does with his lineups because I don't know if you start him. I don't know if you bring him off the bench, but it is clear that your team is better when Imani Bates is not on the floor. All right. I think that's it for this opening segment of the Aaron Torres Sports Podcast. Um, what I would say is let's take a little break and let's come back and let's do the full show from beginning to end. Because we're now going to have about an hour and a half worth of content on the Aaron Torres Sports Podcast. As I told you, we will now hit on Spencer Rattler. We will now hit on the Ryan Day to the Chicago Bears rumors. We'll do where Aaron was right, where Aaron was wrong. And I should mention, great interview, by the way, great interview with Bill Snyder, the former head coach at Kansas State. Just a great guy, really fun, really interesting in talking to him um, about his career, Kansas State, what it was like when he got there. He tells the story of the AD ran out of money for renovations when he got there, so he was paying out of his own uh, checkbook, if you will, out of his own pocket for renovations. So just incredible, incredible, incredible stuff via Bill Snyder. Busy show. I should mention, by the way, off the top, I will mention, of course, everything that happened in Kentucky, Tennessee, Arkansas as well this weekend, so be prepared for that. But loaded Aaron Torres Sports Podcast that is now an hour and a half long because I just did 15 minutes on Penny Hardaway. I'll be right back. 